All right, everybody, we have uh, just about reached the end. We have one last performer, uh, and I am thrilled to welcome this person to the stage. Uh, rounding out our show tonight, uh, we have uh, Dr. Ryan Hutchison. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ryan Hutchison has been a primary care doc for the last 20 years, and he's currently clinical teaching faculty at OHSU in the Department of Family Medicine. Uh, these days, he spends most of his time uh, providing medical care in a correctional facility for boys uh, uh, in Southern Oregon. Uh, but that does not deter him, all of these multiple uh, job commitments from being a uh, bang up uh, <laughs> a pickleball player as well as a really, really talented painter. Um, here to tell a story that I am really excited to um, have you guys here as well as a really unique perspective on the COVID pandemic, I'd like to welcome to the stage, Dr. Ryan Hutchison. I'm not the police. I'm your doctor. I actually say this at work sometimes. I, uh, I, I work in a prison, I'm a prison doctor. And you know, if you're a prisoner and you are sick or hurt and you have to see the doctor, I think it's understandable that you might question my loyalty. You might question, you know, who do I really answer to? You might even fear that I'm gonna force you to do something or um, that I'm going to withhold proper medical care for the sake of saving the state money or even worse, to punish you. So I do find from time to time I have to reassure people that my role is, uh, what my role is and that my loyalty is to them and to their best, uh, to their care, I want to give them good care. Um, sometimes I'll even give them the money back guarantee. Plus, the last thing I want to do or, or be is the police. Um, so I, I work at a, a youth correctional facility. Uh, it's for adolescent boys and men from the ages of 12 to 25. It's a campus of buildings surrounded by a giant chain link fence. Inside is a microcosm. It's this uh, miniature little city. So you have the school, the barber shop, the canteen, the clinic, the gymnasium, the metal shop, the greenhouse, um, all of the living units. Uh, the clinic, which, which is where I work, uh, has a dentist, has mental health professionals, and a medical team. Uh, the medical team is me and several nurses. I, by the way, inherited this job from uh, a, an older guy who'd been there for 30 years. He'd retired, uh, and, and he was known as Dr. Cold Hands. <laughs> I always get a kick out of that, I'm sorry. The crowd just went crazy. Um, um, anyway, I see patients there. Uh, I see all the guys on, on intake when they first come in and I follow up with them with various acute and chronic things, mostly uh, that any adolescent would have. Uh, sometimes it's more specific to this population, a lot of broken hands, a lot of broken faces, uh, noses, split lips, uh, self-harm, uh, things of that nature. And I'm happy to say that, you know, the guys are, are treated with a lot of respect uh, in our clinic, I feel like, and, and the resources that I, I have are such that we, we have a pretty high standard of, of care that we can give. And when the pandemic happened, um, the first thing that I thought, I was immediately transported back to medical school in the class that covered public health. And when you learn about public health, the first thing you learn is that there are some settings that are bad for contagious diseases. And Traditionally, these are military barracks, uh, college dormitories, uh, nursing homes, cruise ships, and you guessed it, prisons. As a prison doctor now, I, you have to understand, I was not planning on a pandemic. And so as a prison doctor, this was, I would describe an, as an unexpected big responsibility. Um, I. I knew that I would be needing to give recommendations, public health recommendations that could affect the entire facility. And, and so I had several sleepless nights thinking, how, in, how are we gonna keep this virus out of this facility? 
and how will I contain it uh, once it gets in? And, and really, would any of us survive this thing? So I met with the warden. We actually don't say warden, but it sounds cooler than superintendent. We, I met with the warden, and it was decided that the facility would be closed to all visitors. Um, Inside would be locked down, so school closed, barbershop closed, metal shop closed. All uh, movement and staff interaction would be limited. The, the issue I had is I needed a place to see uh, medically, uh, or medical isolation. I needed uh, a place to care for the, the positive uh, COVID patients and the quarantine uh, of those exposed to uh, positive patients. To that end, we opened up an old cell block. Uh, this, this building, it was built 70 years ago. It's in the back of the, of the campus, hadn't been used for 20 years. The place is made of concrete and steel and bad memories. It's a long corridor lined on one side by bunks and the other side uh, are several individual isolation cells. These cells are like basically uh, crushingly small concrete boxes with steel doors. That would be my medical isolation ward. It was from inside of one of those cells that I looked out at the ward and my imagination went wild about a couple of things. The first thing it saw was kind of dark history of this haunted building. And the other thing it saw, with fear, I saw images of a, of a medical ward overrun by sick patients, kind of reminiscent of the pictures you've seen of like the 1917 uh, flu pandemic. Would, would any of us survive this, really? <clears throat> About that time, it dawned on me, public health is as close to law enforcement as the field of medicine will ever get. So it's the closest the doctor ever comes to being the police. Think about it. The, the mission and the methods are the same. So po the mission of both public health and law enforcement is to protect the public and promote its, its well-being. And they do so by identifying dangerous individuals and isolating them from the population for the greater community's health and safety. And so we sort of implemented all these changes and, and uh, did well for the community, the, the greater community, in collusion with law enforcement. Um, but we did, we did witness kind of a compounded isolation of individuals. As the pandemic went on, we, we indeed had several positive cases. Thank goodness we were never overrun like I feared. Um, I would see them in the ward all gowned up and everything, and, and I would gas them up. I would say, you know, this isolation is your rare opportunity to do something good that is gonna benefit hundreds of people. And, and, and sometimes I would give them the money back guarantee on that one. The sickest guy that we had by far was one of the earliest guys. His name is Dante and he was 24, um, had been locked up since he was 17. To know, you know, Dante, uh, is well known as a guy who has done a lot to sort of change his life, turn his life around. From the very beginning, he took advantage of every opportunity that incarceration ever offered. For example, he graduated from high school, got his welder certificate, he's certified in forklift operation, um, and he became a mentor to young people, uh, even traveled on some speaking engagements to talk kind of the about the pitfalls of gangs and things like that. To know Dante is to love this guy. He's so sweet, 
sort of radiates. He always has this infectious smile. Even if he's sick or, or in pain, he always still has this smile on his face. When Dante was 17, um, he learned that a guy who was buying drugs from him had cheated him. So Dante and his cousin lured the guy into a playground into in, in a park one night. And, and Dante, emboldened by kind of gang code, confronted the guy, stabbed him several times, and left him to die there by the swing set. The victim was a 20-year-old DACA recipient with a baby on the way. So I, I mentioned that Dante was really sick. Um, by the way, he insisted on being in one of those individual concrete box cells so, so that he could protect the staff. He didn't want to give the staff anything. Anyway, he had a high fever and rigors, sweat all over his face, covered in blankets, trembling. And the nervous smile on his face really couldn't hide the fear that he had. And honestly, we were all scared. This was very early. Um, I didn't know if any of us were going to survive, really. One time, uh, I was approaching isolation ward to see him. And as I walked up to see Dante, I considered another time that authority was approaching Dante. And I, th I was thinking about another time in Dante's life when authority deemed it important to identify him and to isolate him from the community. It was a long time ago. He was 17. I imagine at that time he was also sweaty, heart racing, and scared. But really, that authority was not me. That was when he was being arrested. That's, that's, I'm not the cops. I'm not the police. I'm your doctor. Thank you. <laughs> 